So uh, first correction is that uh, Tecoforex is a company that I had founded previously, but that company has been acquired. And my current affiliation is with Baylor College of Medicine, where I'm an associate professor in the Center for Drug Discovery. So the work I'm talking about today is totally at Baylor, nothing from Tocofrex. Right, so the Center for Drug Discovery at the Baylor College of Medicine has, it's an academic group, and so the primary vision is to bridge the gap between academic and pharmaceutical research with an economical path. And we obviously want to move our discoveries into startup companies. We're a decent sized academic group and we receive funding from the following groups listed at the bottom of this slide. By the way, the confidential is just because that's the slide template. Nothing I'm presenting is highly confidential. It's not confidential at all. Right, so um, just wanted to go through a quick summary of DNA encoded libraries and how we use them to perform selection. So this is going to be a fast run through. If you're unfamiliar, there are publications that describe this. But it's basically a split and pool uh, process in which a single compound is combined with a PC DNA and then through chemical methods and through DNA synthesis, the compound is made larger and DNA oligos are added. So that at the end you have a pool of um, perhaps millions or billions of DNA tagged compounds. And the way you identify which particular compound is binding to your protein of interest is through DNA sequencing, right? And so just to quickly bring you over to this part, you identify compounds of interest. And then the medicinal chemistry part starts where you resynthesize what you think you discovered off of the DNA encoded chemical libraries, right? And then the processes after that would follow a traditional path forward. Um, so these just identify the people that are involved in the process. Currently, we have around uh, 40 libraries with over 5 billion unique compounds in this library system. And we can perform somewhere around uh, two to three selections per week. Uh, and each of those two to three selections per week with a unique protein um, survey those 5 billion compounds. Right, so there's a lot of information here, and I'm just going to keep going for the sake of time. Um, so the way that these results are analyzed has been presented in the past in type of a, in a type of cube format, where you present information in in three directions. Um, this is a little bit difficult to interpret, hard to understand, and so a recent publication, 2019, identifies work done by Dr. Favor and other people in our group. <clears throat> where the presentation of the results are in a much more simple way to understand. And all of the compounds that are enriched for the particular protein of interest fall along the x-axis. And those compounds that are either nonspecific or they are relevant to a different uh, condition in the incubation are shown on the y-axis. Anything that shows uh, activity in both situations would fall along um, the uh, a, a line of slope indicating how close they are to the X or the Y axis. And just as, as an example that is provided in this publication in 2019, um, the green circles represent two cycles, so two, um, two chemical syntheses that were done with DNA the yellow refers to three chemical syntheses, each with a piece of DNA, and the blue refers to just a single compound, a single chemical entity on a piece of DNA. And from that, uh, what was decoded, uh, this was work done to copy what had been done in a uh, GSK program, where we tried to I 
identify through chemical synthesis compounds similar to this one. Um, and when put on DNA, we looked at the various times that those compounds showed up in our DNA encoded libraries, right? So this one came up once, this one came up 400 times, 1600 times, and then with the uh, hydrogen 200 times. And the relative affinity of those compounds are shown, right? So it's a way to generate a diverse library with a number of synthons that have increasing, hopefully, affinity. Right, so what I thought I would do in the next few slides is just give you a few examples of hits that came uh, virtually right out of the DNA encoded library selections. So this represents a TGF beta family of receptors. And uh, what we're focusing on is a type two receptor. So shown in this cartoon on the left hand side, um, the way that these receptors work is that there is a a ligand binding shared event between the type two receptors and type one receptors. Phosphorylation is transferred from the type two receptor to the type one receptor, and then the type one receptor signals into the cell through a set of uh, transcription factors called SMADs. So in this particular example, um, we identified a compound that had, in the middle panel, very good selectivity for one of the TGF beta family members, BMP, so bone morphogenetic protein receptor type 2, and a related one is active in receptor type 2, type A. And you can see that 1115, which was resynthesized from DNA encoded chemical library, had a KI of around four nanomolar compared to a closely related receptor where the KI was around 150,000 nanomolar, 153 micromolar. From that, we took that particular compound into a kinome scan to determine the relative selectivity of those compounds and they, re they appear remarkably selective. So just as one example, it seemed that this was an approach that could yield in a faster approach, uh, novel ligands, and it also appears the way that we set up this, the selection that we could also obtain highly selective compounds. Uh, I showed you the BMPR2 in the previous slide relative to the active in receptor, and now this is just the converse, where we looked at active in receptors and we found a separate compound that was resynthesized, 1117. And so its affinity for active in receptor type 2A is six nanomolar compared to the MPR2 where the affinity is around 582 nanomolar. You can see that CD D1117 shows some selectivity in the kinome scan shown on the right hand side, but probably not as selective for its ligand. And so one of the things you could imagine we're doing is trying to improve the selectivity profile of those compounds. Um, what are the indications for these? And so that's kind of shown with the, the dogs in the middle panel that um, receptors that are, sorry, ligands that target these receptors could be involved in uh, muscle accumulation and so one of the relevant ligands that binds to activin and BMP receptors is myostatin. And in the knockout of myostatin, uh, this is a natural genetic mutation in dogs, that they become highly muscular, muscularized compared to animals that have uh, the non-mutated myostatin. Right? So it represents that these compounds have an opportunity to address muscle wasting syndromes. All right, a third example is something that we're working on because of our long experience, both in my previous company and as well at the current laboratory in reproductive biology. And so this is looking at a male contraceptive. And so the, the slide on the left-hand side simply shows uh, an in vivo result demonstrating the activity of these compounds uh, to cause a decrease in hyperactivated sperm. 
Uh, and so this would represent a contraceptive mechanism where a man could take it and the sperm would retain the, the inability to be hyperactive and achieve fertilization. In, this, in that particular example, let me go back up, uh, we also assess the selectivity within the bromodomain proteins in that field, and it appears to be rather selective for the proteins we're interested in. So the title of the talk was on metabolic stability and um, uh, permeability. And so we follow what many people do for metabolic stability. And so this just shows uh, an example of frequently obtained results where in this particular case, the stability in mouse liver microsomes is quite short, doesn't allow us to really profile the biology of the compounds very well. And so we're pursuing something that's everyone else in the industry is doing is trying to do improved stabilization of our compounds. But the majority of the time that I have left, I'll spend on permeability. And so this is a cell system that everyone's, or most people are probably very familiar with, which is KCO2. And you look for the transport of compounds from the upper chamber, the A chamber to the B chamber, or otherwise from the B chamber to the A chamber. And so the following slides all represent some measures obtained from these particular experimental setups. In order to show these slides in this presentation format, I pulled up a former data set that just overviews the permeability profiles of a number of marketed drugs. And then what I've done is represented where some of our compounds are relative to those that are, are marketed, just to give you a sense of whether it's good, bad, or ugly, right? And so from a first attempt, this is a bromodomain inhibitor. This is a TGF-beta family member, and then several others, including other bromodomain proteins. And so the first observation is that the permeability for the bromo domains and some of the others are really poor. Uh, and there's some permeability associated with these TGF beta receptor molecules that appear amazingly good. Uh, we've done it in the A to B and the B to A format, and the results uh, from either format appear quite interesting. Um, I think I'll, oh, I, sorry, that's a different slide. This particular one just shows at different concentrations. So at a lower concentration, many of the compounds that were uh, less permeable are now permeable, reflecting some problems with solubility of these compounds. And that's another effort that we are addressing is to improve solubility of some of the compounds. The reference uh, compounds are shown over on the right-hand side. Uh, if we look at those same particular compounds um, uh, and then develop a ratio to reflect uptake, again, you can see that there was net uptake of the bromo domain proteins. Um, this particular one had a real problem with recovery, um, one to three percent recovery, and so we do not believe that this reflects any true performance of the KCO2, and there's a real problem with solubility of these compounds. We also notice that there's significant efflux in this particular system. So again, these are the bromodomain inhibitors, and there's tremendous efflux of these uh, bromodomain proteins out of the, from the B to the A chambers. Um, and so that's something that we are starting to look at and see if there are ways that we can address the efflux or if that's simply the mechanism by which BET inhibitors um, in our hands as well as in several other groups uh, have difficulty achieving their clinical objectives. Right, so based on what we learned before, we've tried to improve permeability of various compounds. Right, and so again, showing in this format, this just represents permeability on the y-axis and the various compounds are shown plotted here against the background of the reported permeability of approved drugs. 
I've put down on the bottom the recovery just so that you can uh, appreciate that we're getting reasonable recovery, not terrific recovery in every case, but reasonable recovery, except in the case of uh, this particular compound over here. Um, so uh, these represent, again, a uh, bromo domain, uh, sorry, it is a TGF beta family member group of compounds in this first cluster, um, followed by a number of other targets that are unrelated to the TGF beta family member. So the, the bottom line is we are finding ways to improve solubility, sorry, to improve permeability and solubility. Um, and that uh, we seem to have uh, reasonable uh, transport in the other direction, B to A. The next few slides summarize that. Right, so if we're looking at uptake for that TGF beta receptor family of compounds, we're getting quite dramatic uptake of these particular compounds. Uh, not in every case, but we are getting significant uptake in some examples. Uh, this is an example of a compound that is not a TGF beta receptor ligand. It is a uh, it is a different kinase inhibitor. This is an analog of that particular compound that only differs differs by a methyl group. So there's something interesting going on, and evaluating these permeability groups helps us to understand where we need to go next in our chemistry. So. Um, one explanation from our recent results, particularly with regard to the TGF beta receptor family of uh, kinase inhibitors, is that CACO2 cells do express those membrane receptors. And so I'll point out over here on the right, particularly PMPR2, again, from this citation provided down in the bottom. And it suggests that there is a possible mechanism responsible for the uh, transport of these particular proteins across CACO2 cells at a much more impressive rate than would be expected by just the passive diffusion. Um, I'm down to my last 30 seconds. So uh, just to identify on this slide that we've provided uh, indications of the qualification of our reference compounds in CACO2. So this is the colchicine uptake ratio in our system. The uptake was about 0.3, and we're similar to that as reported in this paper over here. We're a little bit lower when we go from the 6.5 to, that's my timer. Go away. Uh, right, and so um, compared to the uh, similar pH in both the A and the B chamber, uh, our values are a little bit lower than reported, but they're not too much different. So we think that uh, our CACO2 system is operating properly. Um, same type of thing for propranolol. Uh, our results were around 30.8 times 10 to the 6 centimeters per second. Uh, similar to what was reported. Sorry that I didn't provide the reference here. So a quick summary, first set of compounds evaluated for CACO2 permea permeability included compounds with poor solubility, poor recovery, poor permeability. Um, all of those were generated in a pH 7.4, both in the upper and the lower chamber. Um, the reference controls performed as expected, but we saw quite a bit of these uh, efflux of BET inhibitors. We adapted the CACO2 conditions um, to adjust for what might be considered like a, a fed state where the A chamber is 6.5, the B chamber is 7.4, and the rationale there was just to try and achieve ways where we could improve permeability. Um, so one of the conditions we're left with is, was it our assay conditions or the compounds that we generated that led to the improved permeability. And so we're obviously going back to address that. I think some of the interesting features we found are uh, that these bromo, uh, sorry, the 
TGF beta receptor type compounds uh, have an interesting feature we saw both in the pH 7.4 top and bottom or different pH 6.5 top 7.4 and bottom and that there is significant uptake we're now starting to look if these compounds have any effect in uh, in CACO2 cells as a starting point and then generally to look beyond that at um, human intestinal cells as well as mouse intestinal cells in culture and then also to carry that in vivo. So that was a very quick short run through um, what we've done and with that I'll stop and take any questions. I have a question related to your technology. Can you go the other way around where you have a let's say a clinical candidate and you define, identify the proteins ultimately, the protein target that particular type of molecule is capable of interacting with? You mean in our DNA encoded libraries? Um, so one of the techniques we often do is we use a known compound um, and we can uh, add that to our selection techniques and we use that to confirm one set of compounds that bind in an expected manner, right? In other words, similar to the reference compound, whether it's approved or published or whatever. And then we can identify compounds that bind in a different mechanism to that known inhibitor. Is that the question you're asking? I think I, I, you answered essentially what you understood. Okay, so whatever it, I realized ultimately the mistake I made in asking the question. So thank you. <laughs> uh, okay, well, uh, hopefully the question I answered is the question you wanted an answer to. Well, the answer is you gave a very good answer for, in terms from your perspective. The question really what I'm having from a systems pharmacology perspective it is identifying selective drug targets that's not necessarily, it, it is important, but it's not the whole thing. It really, the question becomes, if we talk about cross-pathway reactivity, which means the, the lack of selective activity at, at the broad spectrum of proteins, not just essentially the nearest neighbors, yeah. because, and, and that, that ultimately determines the uh, outcome of clinical trials efficacy toxicology. So if you have, for example, a phase one compound, and you will be able essentially to assess the spectrum of essentially quote unquote biological targets. You know, that then you can deduct from, from that information what's the likelihood that you run into toxicology problem, efficacy issues, and stuff like that. So, taking it the other way around, but, but I understand now that your technology is not able to deliver that. Okay, and, and that was the mistake of my question. Uh, so, thank you for the expanded explanation of the question. Um, so you are correct that we would have to do those proteins one by one in separate incubations. Um, but in principle, it's possible to take, um, for example, liver enzymes, conjugate those to beads and use those as the protein to which you would look for selection. But it, it seems a complicated process I think we both agree it will be complicated. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Hi, Stephen. Really great talk. And if you would relate to your colleagues that I thoroughly appreciated the detail in that 2019 uh, ACS com combinatorial science paper, uh, especially in the SI. It was very helpful in, in understanding your thinking there and, and how to set that data analysis up. My question for you was, do you Seeing the the challenge with uh, uh, challenges with passive permeability and stability, are you are you in the team at Baylor uh, applying a deeper level of uh, analysis to your Dell hits and selecting compounds to make by looking at calculated parameters for these uh, physicochemical properties? Uh, again, reinterpreting your question, I think oh, okay. are, are are we. Uh, using algorithms to generate better compounds that have likelihood of better permeability. I think that's what you're asking. And or, or even just you know, things you already have in the library, you know, looking at what are the, the calculated properties of your library, of the, the hits that you find for your target, to so you use that as a, as a way to direct you to the hit to make off DNA. 
Uh, we haven't done that yet. And I think the reason is that we've just now started moving towards the permeability assessment. You know, step mm -hmm. one was getting the hits. Step two was resynthesizing compounds that look like they hold water. Mm -hmm. and, then, uh, and then the next step is being able to do some permeability assessment. So what we need to generate is a package of information that tells us something about what's a more permeable permeable mm -hmm. compound versus less mm -hmm. permeable, and then start to use that in uh, assessing what compounds we make next. Okay, great, thank you. question uh, regarding um, things for a very nice talk and I have a question regarding your system that you are using do you think that if could you, you would... get closer to the microphone I yeah I... Uh, I'm sorry uh, I was uh, wondering if you would use different system do you think that you will have different heats instead of using gecko two cells different permeability Right, because the Keiko 2s have nothing to do with the DNA encoded selection. Right, yeah. just want to make okay. Yeah. Um, um, would we get different permeabilities? So, in particular, you're talking about the bromo domain proteins where there's efflux and the TGF beta receptor like molecules where you get uptake. Right, yeah. so the short answer would be yes, and we're not there yet, but yes, we will do that. Right, so I mean, uh, you know, a next logical set of cells to look at would be endothelial cells to see if we get similar results or different results. Yeah. Thank you. And, and obviously, if you're getting significant uptake of a yeah. particular set of molecules in a certain cell type, that would be quite interesting. Yeah, cell type specific. Uh, uh, differences and um, seeing which yeah. organs you can actually then target as well. So yeah. it's possible that some cells are going to be much more, I don't know, uh, much more um, um, affected um, and um, by uh, your compound versus others. I agree. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 